Hello, everybody. Hi, work. All right. So, uh, my phone. Yes. In case of emergencies, always. Yes. So, yeah, thank you um, for coming out tonight for the Juan Alloy celebration. Yes, you can make some noise. Um, so you'll see these flyers around. On the back, there's like his ballroom things, or tings. Uh, if you haven't been friends with him on Facebook since 2016, you might have not heard of it yet. But uh, it's a, a few selected quotes. So there's like at least 10 different quotes, yeah? So let's see who can find the most. And it's a lot of wisdom. Um, yes. So I would like to start um, to have our first guests here on the panel. I feel like I'm going to sit for a second. Hi. Um, yeah, so I feel like there could have been a lot of people uh, to sit on this panel, because Juan Alor touched a lot of people. Yeah? <laughs> but because it's about music, I wanted to have these people here that also continue his tradition of music and DJing at the balls. So give it up for all of the DJs. Yeah? They're always in the back. We always tell them, play this beat, do this again, stand behind them, spill a drink on their laptop. Maybe don't forget to give them drinks, yeah? So it's a very important uh, spot for us because we all go off on the music, right? Yes, we do. So I would like to welcome to the stage Mother Kitty, gorgeous Gucci, also known as Kitty Smile. Mwah. Yes, what's up? I would like to welcome to the stage JJ Revlon, all the way from the UK. Yes, maybe I'm gonna sit over here. Mm -hmm. um, Kitty, you are cold. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and I would like to. Uh, welcome, DJ Seven Gasson from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Clunk, clunk. Yeah, so since it's very hard to sum up what Wanalo did, what he means, excuse me, hello. Thank you. So since it's very hard to sum up what Wanalo did for the community, what he means, what he changed, I just like wrote down some words that remind me of him. Creative, innovative, humor, but still humble, shady, fierce, passionate about ballroom. And I think passionate about ballroom is the most important. Like that was his mission, right? He would share so that ballroom can flourish, right? Yes. He would share his music. For those that known him back in the day, it was his CDs, like Street Star Mix. You had, you, right, the old CDs. Who has a CD of one, Alor? Let's see who, how old we are. <laughs> yes, come on over 25. <laughs> yeah, so the old days, yeah. Uh, for the new generation, yeah, you got the wee transfer links, right? Who got a wee transfer link from Juan Alora? Put your hand up. Who shared that link with their kids? Put your hand up. Yes, you know how it goes, right? So he was very generous. I don't know if he ever slept, to be honest, because he was always looking crazy at work, the way he would put it in words, yes. Still doing, and by the way, he worked at the State Department in Washington, DC, right? He had a legit day job, looking crazy on the laptop. <laughs> Tech department, yeah? Uh, he would still like produce beats at work, after work, before work, at the hotel room after a ball. Yeah, that was Juan Alora. And um, after he passed away, so many people I talked to were like, yeah, I used to talk to Juan every week. I used to talk to Juan every two days. I used to write to Juan all the time. And I'm like, but everybody says this from different time zones. I'm talking about Japan, Russia, Europe. Okay, we're kind of in the same time zone, right? But you know, <laughs> USA with all of the different time zones. How did he do that, right? 
And I think that's, um, for our house personally, he's very important because he came to Germany in 2013, the first time. I think it was my longest LSS ever. It's like f <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it was still the time where we were figuring out what voguing and ballroom actually really is. So it's just a whole lot of mix of everything in five minutes. But it was fierce, because the beat was fierce. Archie was there, Archie Burnett, also in the house tonight. Yes. Yes, also in Germany since 2013 for the ballroom. Funkin' Styles, 2008. Yeah. And I remember the after party was at this uh, Tak Theater uh, close to Moritzplatz, like the thing before Prince Charles. It's not Prince Charles, but the thing before Prince Charles. Yeah, it's like a theater. So we were there, and the guy was like, yeah, you have to be out at two. I'm like, okay, we'll manage. So then one plays the after party, and at two, I see this guy, he's super happy, super high. Like, whoa! I'm like, don't we have to close the... He's like, nah, it's fine. <laughs> Where? Come on, one, you twisted that. So we stayed there until five, and at five my body was tired. I was tired because I had like a whole week of festival behind, my, behind, right? And I'm like, Juan, you need to stop playing the music. I just can't anymore. Like, we're done. Don't do this to me. <laughs> yeah. So that was his mission, I think, to like make people go crazy on the dance floor. He would like want to make you move for like hours until, like literally until you can't anymore. That was his mission, right? It was, literally. <laughs> And um, yeah, I think that's already a lot said. And um, for tonight, I'm very happy that you are here, right? Juan did, yeah, give it up for the three <laughs> DJs for Europe that are stepping into these shoes. So I basically have two very uh, simple questions because I feel like they will speak for themselves. Um, and you can decide if you want to answer in which order. Um, so how did you meet Juan Alora for the first time? I can maybe start with my story, well, oh, unless you have yours. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there's two moments, but I felt like the first, mm, the first one could have been, no, yes, got it. Are we here? Yeah, we are. So the first time was basically, um, Vaughn used to play a lot of the whacking competitions in London by Bagsy. Uh, he's a UK whacker. And Bagsy just asked me to to host. And I was like, this is weird, like hosting a whacking battle. But I did it anyway. And I literally know him from like social media, obviously couple of messengers but it felt like I knew like knew him for time like I knew him for years but I didn't I knew of him and his music for years and it was it was all, all of a sudden it was told to me that it was his birthday so I was like this is great idea like I'm, if you know me I'm a social person I'm very much like let's go to dinner let's party blah 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 I used to work at this place called Blue's Kitchen in Shoreditch great barbecue meats Thank you. And literally, I went in there. Everyone, like, well, most of the people who knew me in there. So I was like, oh, can I get this caravan? It's my friend's birthday. Literally, all of a sudden, caravan, food on tap, on tap, on tap, on tap. And then I was like, okay, go to cross the street because, you know, everyone loves, loves a Haribo, loves a Golden Bear. Went across the street, bought this shit. And we basically just had a birthday party inside, <laughs> inside this caravan. It was super last minute because I actually didn't know it was his birthday. And then we stayed up all night in this hotel. Me, him, Bagsy, and a guy called Brian Green, who's also a worker from the US. Thanks, guys. So, <laughs> so we all was in the hotel um, not far from this place. And we like stayed up to, like, as you know, it doesn't like to end. Stayed up all night. I think it got to like... Same. My body was tired at like two. It's like three, four. I'm like, there's more stories and more stories and more stories. And then he says, um, give me your USB. Him and Brian Green. So I was like, I might get his USB back, you know, because DJs, we don't like to share USBs. Not a lie. Let's tell the truth. Uh, well, that's a lie. <laughs> 
for some. So I was very like, oh, what are they going to do with my USB? Anyway, I got my USB back. When I tell you, I cannot, I still haven't to this day gone through the catalog of music till this day. And Brian Green stuff was sick. All this house shit was amazing. But what shit? Like crazy. But that was the time that I got to meet and that was it. The second time where I really met, where I really met him was with Sid in London. We did a ball and I asked him to play. He was already coming because he was playing a different club. And then it got like, it got a little bit complicated because like budgets and stuff. But then what happened was super magical, which was he saw the whole ball and then played for like four hours or some shit. And we were like, you need to stop anyway. He did a lot of stop. And that was, I think, like, those two moments are really special because, like, I feel like I met this person in, like, two different ways. Obviously, I was so much icon Glow's ball and stuff like this. But it was, like, I felt like these were, like, two two completely different ways of, like, meeting meeting more. So, yeah, those were the... That, that was my little story. Thank you. So me, I met I met <coughs> Vaughn in two thousand and nine, I think, here in Berlin, at the Berlin Festival. <coughs> I was already performing uh, music, and the festival hired me to perform a couple of songs on a stage. I wasn't part of ballroom. I knew about voguing. I didn't know about ballroom, and I had um, back then um, dancers with me, Onesha. Um, Yaki Mugler was dancing for me. And there was this like three people. Yeah, there were three people in um in the audience and they were just like staring at us as I was doing my thing. And then backstage we met them and it was um Vaughn that actually told me that I should be in Boron because he wished that um it would become something here and uh, to see big black boys doing their thing and then uh, the energy that I had reminding him a lot of uh, of ballroom. It, it, has no, it had nothing to do with me it's just because Anisha was just dipping all over the place and I think <laughs> but um, and that's also where I met Jack Jack Mizai because they were both booked with um, and I think it was Javier with them but it was a very long time ago and and I saw him again at Berlin Vogue Now here. And um, I, back then I wasn't a DJ. I was just performing. I was not a DJ. And then um, I went up to him and was like, oh, I'm a DJ now. And he was like, OK, good. We need, <laughs> we need more ballroom DJs. I was like, I oh, know I don't want to do this. I don't want to DJ at balls. Because I don't like the way people talk to DJs at balls. I don't like what, how people invert their space and everything. And he would he understood that, but it was like, if it's not you, who is it going to be? Because uh, not everybody had budget to bring him over or to bring Mike Q over. And um, he kind of pushed me, and I was like, well, uh, then I'll just I'll do it, but they have to dance on what I want. And it was like, no, it's not about you. It's really not about you. You're here to help them give their best performance. And then I was like, okay, but yeah. And then he was like, I'll give you some music. And I was very interested in that, in having the, mu <laughs> in having the music. So yeah, Von is, I, th I, I miss him a lot. I miss talking to him because he would put things in perspective when you think Something dramatic happens to you, and then uh, he's been through all of that, and then the wasting is like a oh, child. It won't matter like in two weeks, and would just like make you see the bigger picture, but always very encouraging and supporting and like pushing people. Sometimes in corners where you wouldn't go, but for the for the good. Thank you. Um. I'll be honest with you, I do not remember the first time I met him. <laughs> That's not the way my brain works. Uh, what I do remember is my first time 
working with him. Um, because I probably like I joined the ballroom scene uh, beginning of 2017, so I've probably seen him at a ball while I was walking or just there, uh, but not you know no real interaction. Uh, but my first time like really having an actual interaction with him was Milkshake Festival 2018. That was the one where <laughs> where the tent fell down. <laughs> So um, anybody, y'all know Milkshake Festival? It's like this huge queer festival in Amsterdam and Amber Vineyard, mother of the house of Vineyard, hosted this ball at Milkshake Festival every year until 2018 uh, because that was the day where, uh, due to some inclement weather, uh, the stage kind of broke down and all the ballroom girls are basically standing around the stage waiting, hoping for them to like, have it repaired so maybe we can actually do something <laughs> and that didn't happen and so basically the ball was technically cancelled but they decided to continue it at this club called club nix now um one thing i can tell you about club nix is that it is small <laughs> and the milkshake balls were big and so it was it was a process uh so that was like already an interesting kind of uh, <laughs> uh thing um by that time i had already started djing a little bit so i got to basically stand in the booth with them at the time basically because there was nowhere else for me to stand in that place and yeah i got to basically shadow him and watch him work and and He'd just be doing his thing, and you know, he just like turn to me every once in a while. I'd be like, "Watch this," <laughs> <laughs> and then he plays something, and just you just see the entire room, which is already like oh, everybody huddled up like sardines, and you just see the entire room like erupt in just splendor, joy, just energy, and and that was when I. I probably experienced it before, but like seeing it and seeing like the cause and effect was the first time I really witnessed the magic, if you will. So yes, witness the magic is the right word. Thank you. Yeah, he was a fierce DJ. Like at a ball, he would cut people off, stop the beat if you're in his way. Like he would be that DJ to be like, don't, don't fuck with me. Like without me, nothing is gonna happen at this ball. <laughs> you know. Cuts the beat and stares an upcoming chop. Yes! <laughs> that meme with the chihuahua. <laughs> yeah, like I said, funny. He was funny, yeah? Whatever you would do. But yeah, he's been like in ballroom for a long time. He's seen the development of how DJing, beat producing, which beats are being played, the chanting or commentating on the mic has developed, yeah? Because he's been playing with MC Debra or Jack Mizrahi, like... He's seen the people grow, like he's then came to Europe and see the scene grow, like from playing at like just the boo, yeah? Like being the first to like invite him to this party in Paris, which was hot with all of the house dancers and everybody going off. Yeah, him going to Funkenfest in Germany, playing at uh, little balls that we had, a uh, ball, yeah three categories that we had at Rita Wutzke, <laughs> right? Uh, the Funken Styles voguing category at um, the, the Tempodrome. So he was around to see and then to see ballroom actually start, right? And it made such a difference because at the beginning we had like DJs. And we're like, okay, there was this one DJ here, Jan Kedvis, which he was a journalist. So he had been doing interviews about ballroom. He knows about music that's like, Part of his job is research, music journalism. So we're like, hey, don't you want DJ for a ball? You know, but then the second year, we like got one. And I'm like, okay, that's, uh, and we booked two DJs. We're like, okay, well, we'll do this half the other DJ. And then one started where he looked at me like, another DJ? Ciao, I need another DJ. Okay. Like, cause I didn't understand. I'm like, what, you're gonna play like six, seven hours alone? It's like, yeah. Okay, all right. So, yeah, for me, it was just magic to see how he would read the room, really create the energy, create challenges also, especially for people to be on beat. Because, you know, it's never the beat. Yes, it's you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he was a really fierce DJ and I think has inspired a lot of people to do things 
um, to step in those shoes. So the second question would be, um, how did he inspire you guys as a DJ, as a commentator maybe, or as a beat producer? Um, and what about the, his music kind of inspires you? <coughs> what I loved about Vaughn and how he would put together, um, the, the, the part that I loved the most wasn't the balls. Uh, it was a tremendous DJ for balls and um, I think he won't be unmatched. Like, I think balls have changed since he's not here to play them. But I really loved um, when he would play the after parties and this is what would um, actually get me because when when DJs are, aren't just playing for people's performance and sometimes the performance that they can't even see because there's too many people in front of them. But a set is kind of like, it's like the DJ is um, driving a boat. He's taking you on a tour of his favorite places. And with Vaughn, I loved how he always had energy. And this is what I got from him. Energy, a little bit of your roots, a little bit of the roots of a ballroom, what ballroom has become, and what ballroom has inspired. So we c you could find like Afrobeats, techno, um, all kind of genres in it, but the way we just blend them together would make so much sense. And this is what I loved about him. I had the opportunity to work a couple of times with him on beats, because we did for this um, for this movie we that was shot in Paris. That was terrible. Paris is um, Paris is voguing. That was like oh. the that was the the intention of like trying to make um trying to make um a Paris is burning French version but like completely failed. Um it was shot right about the time I arrived in 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 Bolhom in Paris, like twenty thirteen. And everybody was excited because uh there was a camera, there was a promise that it would be on TV and I was like you have to understand somebody's coming here and like filming your lives, you're giving so much, but you don't know where, who you're going to be in 10 years, where it's gonna end up and all of that. I, was, I, was, I made everything, I used every strength, like every fiber of my being for this movie not to happen, but still happened. So if you cannot beat them, you join them. So I made the music um, from the opening, the, um, the opening scene, but I had never done a beat before, a, a ballroom beat, so. I asked a lot of, um, I did it with Lazy Flow, which is a French producer. And we were like FaceTiming all the time with Vaughn that would like, tell us like, just do it like that. It would like, you could send it to me and I would do it, but it's better if you, if I show you, if you, you learn, it will be better. So he gave us a bunch of tips for that. And he also told, that's why he was telling me a lot. It was like, share this with people. Don't keep it to yourself, share it with uh other people, preferably black and queer, but if they're not black and queer, it's okay. Let's just let the culture live on. And um, yeah, that's how, uh, that's uh, that's all. It remakes also many of my music, and he would send me stories, a 50 second snippet of things that I was like, I love it, but never send it to me. So <laughs> it's, it's somewhere, but um, it was, um, it was a, like, I don't know how he find time to do all that, honestly, yeah. It would be like, oh, I like this, but you know, like the energy that was in the, like the first minute, can you keep that? It was like, okay, I start over and come back with something completely different. I don't know. I guess that's a genius. Yes, definitely a genius. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> So, uh, inspired. So, basically, that one clip, I Richie so bad on dates, but that one clip where he couldn't see, and it's like five minutes of him telling everyone to move out the way, literally learned a lot from that. That one clip, I literally learned a lot. Um, it made me a bit more uh, outspoken as a DJ, because I agree. Like, 
I don't agree with like how some talk to DJs when it comes to balls. Um, so it made me more outspoken. Um, which is crazy because sometimes like there's been times I've played and then they were like, change the beat. And I'd be like, no. Because Vaughn wouldn't really do, wouldn't do that. Like, bitch, Vaughn. Like, uh, <laughs> it'll be a different like, beat. I'm not changing it. But sometimes I understand when the beat needs to be changed. But my, one thing was that being very outspoken and like how much um, he played with music when he played. So not mainly in balls, but mainly in a... DJ set way, as Kadia said, even at the whacking battle, like, <laughs> and, then, and then sometimes I would like go behind the deck and be like, what's behind there? Just a laptop, nothing else. So for me, it makes me like not complain. Like we can, be, like, you can go, you can get so stuck in your ways when you DJ, like if you DJ with CDJs, it's like mostly easy than laptop, but, I've been, I've been promised so many th things when it comes to like different boards in different countries, but then it's not able to be facilitated. And I always think back to the time that I actually saw him playing like this whacking battle. And I'm telling you, this whacking battle was like 10 a.m. all the way to like 7 p.m. I think there was a break for like 15, 20 minutes. And he like did not stop playing, sweating behind the booth, not playing, just having a whale of a time. And just seeing, and again, like seeing how he plays his music, like even being on the mic while he played the ball was like a big thing. I was like, this is crazy. Like how someone thinks about music is crazy. Like to me, for me, I would need like four decks or six decks and 700 USBs and like chain music and overlap and a laptop. <laughs> like, it just threw me, completely threw me. Because the way he lays music is crazy. And I think a big inspiration also is, like, I do want to produce music, but more, kind of. Yeah, I do. And there's a big thing that he said in an interview he did in Finland. There's a mix. It's uh, being promoted by mix, uh, mix Mag. But he says that um, with his music, people feel like in the club that it sounds like underproduced, but it's not. It's like, that's how I want it to sound. And I think being true to your sound as a producer is hard when you got so many people having a say in your shit or when you ask advice and they might not teach you, but they just tell you like, send it to me and I'll do it for you. I've been told that several times. Um, and I think th th those all those things collide, I think, you know, coming into Christmas in 2023, but I will go into the year really thinking about those things, you know, and when I'm producing, how I want it to sound, as well as keep playing with music and keep overlapping and maybe somehow learn how to loop seven tracks over one on a laptop. Work <laughs> <laughs> on a laptop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm trying to filter out what not to say and what to say because there's a lot here. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, he definitely uh, taught me that as a DJ, specifically for the balls, that you do have uh, a voice, even if you don't always have a mic, if you get what I mean. Like I said, change the beat. No, just trust me on this. You know, you can you can assert yourself at times, and especially when it comes to things like I can't fucking see, <laughs> because people are in front of me, I, I've, I've tried it and it works, just don't play the beat. And then eventually the commentator gets pissed off, like what's happening, and it's like, sort it out. They don't listen to me, so somebody else has to say it then, and then, you know, it resolves itself. So stuff like this, uh, definitely. Um, True. That is Did also that? an option. <laughs> 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 Say it again with the microphone. I think the back didn't hear it. <laughs> I am not. I mean, I am not um, pointing fingers. But sometimes people just change. Just won't change the beat because, as the commentator, they cannot. They don't. Let's not say they cannot chant on it, but that doesn't find his way inside the beat in order like to be efficient. But. Um, Yes, but I do agree that Bibi Vogue 
version performance should be on the ha in the ha only. True. Um, especially when it came to uh, the difference between DJing a DJ set at a club and DJing for the balls, where you know you're no longer the main character, as it were. You know, you're there to support everybody else. Uh, in the beginning, it was just okay. Find the right beat to play and play it. And what I learned from him, especially that one time in Club Nix, is that uh, you call it driving a boat. Uh, I call it like uh, being a shepherd, you know? If, if you're doing a club set, you can lead from the front. I'm going here and you're following me wherever I'm going. I'm taking you on this journey. And at a ball, it, you're doing the same thing, but you're doing it from the back of the flock, you know? They need to do whatever they need to do and your job is to kind of guide them, kind of nudge them in the right direction. Um, that's how I see it. So you can still definitely make people do things because sometimes the battle will be really hot and then everybody's going crazy and er all the focus is on the runway and I'm in the back there like... Because <laughs> I did. And you know, you can make that happen. You can see that that happens partially bec also because of the performance, also because of the commentators, obviously, but you know, also because you know, you were able to get people into that zone and lead them to that promised land, as it were. Uh, and also, he taught me a lot about uh, interactivity. Uh, and so you can just play the beat, that's one thing, but you can, you can duck it out, you can add crashes, <laughs> you can do so many things, you can chop and screw on the fly, uh, and it will definitely enhance. And, and I eventually, it doesn't only become uh, playing the music, but just kind of uh, manipulating the energy in the room with whatever comes out of the speakers, whatever you make come out of the speakers. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I wanted to add... I wanted to add that before Vaughn, we didn't know what to play for what categories. We, like, we didn't know at all. And... Um, he taught me that for Runaway, there's a certain groove that needs to be there, and then you don't actually have to only play um, bits, bone bits, but you could also uh, look into house and look into techno. And he's the one who introduced me to Gregor Salto, because I didn't know about him or I like, didn't care. But it's perfect for like fashion categories and and Runaway, and like the, di the difference. Um, also, uh, between soft and kind and dramatic, the music is here. I'd like to help also the performance. Um, what else did he? I didn't know what to play for Bizarre, for example. That's the fun part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, me, as I, I, I don't like it, but I don't play balls. No, I don't play at balls anymore. Like, there's plenty of talented, great DJs <laughs> for that. But yeah, but it was uh, at the beginning where we were figuring it out, figuring it out. It was it was hard, and sometimes like we would get people like Jack coming, and other they would be like change the beat, and it was because the beat wasn't right for for this. But like Vaughn would always like help, and if you had a <coughs> a question and be like, oh, I don't know what to prefer, it would send you a file. So um, we're grateful for that. Yeah, I'm very grateful. Oh, I have one more. Yes. <laughs> um, and you said it already, you can add your own roots to whatever you're doing. And I think he did that a lot. Um, I think he did that specifically with music from the 70s and earlier even. Because there's always this kind of pervasive idea that, you know, the, these new girls, you know, they don't respect, you know, where it all came from. And so he would make these remixes, or sometimes not even the remixes, sometimes he'd just play you know, the original song for whatever category, and it would get them up. And it's like, ha, you see? You do actually like it. You know, once it's not forced on you once, it, you, know, once you kind of hear it organically, you're like, ah, oh, you know, I got you moving, though. And that definitely, yeah, uh, that stuck with me a lot, because I'm a techno girl. <laughs> And I always hear a lot of people in my own uh, omgeving say, you know, ah, techno, I'm not into that. You know, it's too repetitive, it's too dark. 
and I played at the ball for runway for whatever category, and you see them moving, and I'm like, got you. So <laughs> Work. Yes. Yeah, he did put all of that into his music. Like, he is Puerto Rican, yes. But then I uh, grew up, obviously, he lived in uh, Washington, D.C., and um, he was in New York for a while, right? I mean, you're going to tell more later. But I know he used to tell me that, like, his mom and his aunt used to go, like, to Studio 54, you know, um, and that he used to sneak in also, you know, into clubs. So I think music is just he grew up with it, and he understood it. And he told me this funny story because his category was Old Way also, right? I don't think there's that many videos online of him walking Old Way, but he was fierce performing behind the DJ booth, giving you, like, musicality, everything just with his arms and his face, head bob, and it was... Yeah, um, yeah, and I remember he was telling me the story about Love is the Message, like the old way track, and he's like, the cats were telling him like, you need to walk on the track, and he hated it, but then what you just said, once it naturally appeared, and he's like, oh, it caught on to me, I kind of, mm -mm, yeah. So that's what music can do, yeah. So the last question would be, what, in your opinion, did Juan do especially for your local scene or for the European scene? or even for the American scene from your perspective? Like what impact did one leave within like your local scene maybe, within the European scene, or even the American scene from your perspective? Like for me it's very hard to like anchor and put his position into words, right? Like what, it, how much he meant. Um, but yeah, to just understand how the community also kind of benefited from him and his input. So I would say um, there was the, there are people that help us um, structure our scene um, because we, when we were doing it, personally had never experienced ballroom in, in America or not in a way that we could understand it because you could go to latex ball and get sharp and come back and still not understand what is the difference between Realness with a twist and twister, you know? And I think Vaughn was very generous over this time to explain us and to let us know the differences between. I remember that when I arrived, like, Paul didn't even know what was a butch queen, what, what it means to be a butch queen. And is the way it was always available to us, for us to grow and. And now, you know, Europe has become like people. Like Alex Mugler laughed at me when I told him, one day Americans are going to come and they're going to walk balls here. And Nikki was like, yeah, I'm sure you're right. They're gonna, but they were laughing. They were kind of like, they're not, I, unless you book them. But if you don't book them, no, no Americans going to come for that. And I think it's because of the impact of Vaughn and the Nikki's and Jack's. Because they were, we were like most of the, um, bo the ballroom, especially the dance, was learned through studios or like from a, a girlfriend. But to have this sense of community and structure and now status, it's, uh, I think it's, this is because mostly of like Vaughn. Like he was involved in making the first legends also here in Europe and and I'm sure that he's looking from upstairs and uh he's being he's gonna be proud. We just ha have to keep doing what we do uh, respectfully and like keep the same energy that he had because it would it would be quick to check a bitch, but it was the sweetest soul. Just in your opinion, what is like the impact that he left, especially for the um, I think one is that I think Germany as a whole, like yourself, has like had like such a privilege to have this person be like uh, the one who kind of implemented the sound. And I think two is like the generosity of it all. I will say this, like in the back end of like, what we've been talking about, like don't let it be till someone like goes that you give them their flowers i found it very like strange for myself sorry to 
science is making me say this, but I felt it was very strange that one person there was no conversation in TJ magazines about 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 him, no feature, no nothing, um, which there is now, thank God, through Samueli in Finland and my contact at Mixmag. But you know, this person should have been honoured like pff, like multiple times over the course of years because not only did they spend 20 years in the scene put put that music into Italy but also then you know has traveled throughout Europe and been so generous with like their giving of music um I, I know that's what I'm saying as a DJ as a whole like there were, exactly house music and everything like I feel like it's that that bit was just like a Shocker to me, so you really need to appreciate DJ's period um, in your warranted countries and stuff like this. Um, but I think, yeah, Europe, I think, has gained a lot. I think us as DJs have gained a lot. I have definitely gained a lot by listening to his music. To be honest, it's literally, I listen to it, like, every day, and my iPhone always tells me to turn down the volume. So, you know, and... It's because like every time I listen to it, there's new things in there, and I think what we should really understand and what we what he has done is like kind of made us all streamline in terms of what we play in certain categories. Even though we take our own little taste and twist on our roots in this, we definitely follow the basis of him and what he brings to the and what he brought to the table and what he produces. You know, I. The LSS, I play that LSSB ciao, every time, every time. And I will be playing it tomorrow and I won't be changing the beat. So, you know, I just think it's also that. And then also, do you know what? Like, even like the, the production of like RuPaul's album, <laughs> it's like, like, yeah, he was on the, right. Empire. But the fact he was on TV, but then this, uh, this, bam, we knew from like years back. So it's just like, I think in Europe, it's we have gained a lot from this person. I think Jim, you y'all had it and it was fab and what he did in the UK for me and even like the whackers is like something. And yeah, I think overall my thesis of what I'm saying is that it's how generous and what we how generous he was to the whole of Europe, not just one city. As we said at still don't understand how he does or done all this stuff right but um it's just how generous he was to like every single country like and it wasn't like one over another we all equally benefit from him and still do to tell the real tea so yeah yeah thank you very much Seven. I don't really know what to add to that. <laughs> now, uh, for me personally, uh, it definitely taught me to uh, just add your own flavor to shit. You know, it needs to come from you. Uh, make them know it, if you will. <laughs> and for yeah, my own country, the Netherlands, and Europe as a whole, I feel uh, the generosity. I mean, uh, people would come up to him after a ball and ask him about... Uh, so sometimes he would seek people out actually and just tell them you know this and this and this you got this and this it's fab and he would remember everybody i've never seen somebody with such a photographic memory and he'd just like talk to everyone and like he'd be at after the balls just like for hours just like going through people's like you you did this fab you need to work on this da -da 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 and he would go through everybody and he'd still be there talking if you still had the time and people would still let him. Um, I've seen that so many times. And yeah, you could not shut him up. And yeah. <laughs> which was good because, you know, we learned a lot. I really want to add that like, I feel very sad for the new generation that will not get to meet him as a person, but also to understand how it could be a win in your wings when you are on the floor. Because for me, it was very frightening to walk in America 
But a couple of times I went there and got chopped. It was it was there and talk keep telling me like keep coming back. Make them know it. I didn't understand make them know it before I got chopped. And and I finally got to have a, have a moment in in New York and I played the video again and again and again. And it was thanks to Vaughn because I was working labels and I was telling my brands and it would put the ha and some kicks on it. And somehow I felt very uplifted and it allowed me to shine at that moment. And um, I don't DJ balls, but I hope people that DJ balls can be like this also like and help. Some people do it, you know, and we're grateful, but like to the level that one was doing it, it's like, it's a it was it was something. Like, it's definitely missed. Definitely, thank you. I think, I think also, uh, for those, because you have DJ balls, let's be real. You have, I've, I've seen you DJ balls. And <laughs> because, because I think there's also, because I think there's also, uh, be being a ballroom DJ is such a niche. I mean, if you Vogue Femme, you can always find other Vogue Femmes to kind of compare yourself to, or at least, you know, find your own people to help lift you up. But as a ballroom DJ, specifically in a more emerging scene, like me five years ago in the Netherlands, you don't really know what you're doing. You just kind of have to wing it. And of course it catches on in your local scene because you know, you're all they have. But uh, just the words of encouragement and just that, it, it's, it's the only validation I've ever gotten that like really just hit <laughs> right here, you know, just to hear him say, you got it. And, it's like, and I think anybody that has ever heard that as a ballroom DJ uh, <laughs> means the world. Uh, let's just say that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I definitely get goosebumps when you DJ at balls. I have to like hold myself together to not go off or to cry because it reminds me so much of one. <laughs> so if you've seen that at a ball, it's probably that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's very special to Germany. I mean, like to me personally, like I could, I was really blessed to call it my father. Um, like you say, the encouragement would be like, you got this on the floor like for runway, like when he was playing, like I felt it, the same you said in New York, like coming at the Black Heritage Ball, walking women's performance, he would slow that beat down to give me that dramatic entrance, we'd be like, Pwah. Pwah. I'm like, wait, the beat's changing, okay, one, Pwah. I got this, Pwah. let's go, Ow. yeah, I'm still a chop, but. <laughs> But I felt it. <laughs> I felt it. <laughs> yeah, so I think like for Germany in the way I would, <laughs> I would want to try to build things whenever I was unsure, like what you said, to be like, child, don't pay into the drama, just keep on going. Like, let them know, let them have it. You're doing good. Just believe in it, be true to like the values of ballroom, the core of ballroom the excellence of ballroom, like he really wanted us to be excellent. He wants us to be in these spaces. He wants us to do these jobs. He wants us to keep the space, gatekeep the space. Like, that's what I take. <laughs> yeah, oh my God. So yeah, thank you very much for this first part. <laughs> Yeah, so I want to thank each one of you for what you also contributed, like musically, um, producing, on the floor, off the floor. Like, uh, yeah, it's amazing to have this legacy also continue. So thank you. Elite Beats. Okay. Elite Beats, yes. And then, uh, yeah, we're going to move on to the second part of the panel. Thank you very much, because can I have a time check? Not that I'll be talking till midnight. You were trying to give it 8.20? Oh, we're still good. 
All right, how's everybody doing? Good, yes? Good.